I read a whole bunch of really, really good books this month. A lot of stuff I really want to sink my teeth into and talk about. So let's go. First off is The Confessions of Franny Langton, which was a reread for me. I am trying to reread more books. I want to go back to some favorite books, things that I have adored, and tear through them again, because if you really love a book, surely you want to read it more than once. So I finally reread The Confessions of Franny Langton by Sarah Collins, which is a piece of historical fiction. It is a gothic novel. It's a lesbian novel. And after I reread it, I decided to put a list together, an article and a video on some of the best lesbian novels that I've read in the last few years. The article was co-written by my co-founder, Jess, and I put the video together. Please check out the video because it didn't get as many views as I expected. The Confessions of Franny Langton is a wonderful, wonderful piece of gothic historical fiction. It is reclaiming that genre in the sense that it is so been dominated by white American and British people since its inception. And Sarah Collins takes the genre and puts it in the hands of a black protagonist from the 1800s. Gothic fiction is also inherently queer. There is a queerness to the genre of the Gothic. Even if the authors and the characters are not explicitly queer, there's something so camp and theatrical and cabaret about the Gothic. And so it makes sense for characters in Gothic fiction to be queer. And here you've got a queer black narrative in The Confessions of Franny Langton. If you wanna know more about it, check out my lesbian novels video and the accompanying article, please. But this is a favorite of mine especially amongst books that have come out in the last five years or so. This is a book that I think about a lot and it was time to revisit it and I'm so glad I did. I also read A Closed and Common Orbit by Becky Chambers. Becky Chambers has quickly become probably my favorite sci-fi author. I've done a video talking about the genius of Becky Chambers. She is an author that I think is injecting a lot of much needed adrenaline into the world of science fiction. Sci-fi over the last few years has had a lot of great new authors come in and revitalize the genre, but none of them have done it in the way that Becky Chambers has. If you want to hear more of my thoughts, please watch that video. But what I love about Becky Chambers is the way in which she approaches science fiction with a wide-eyed stare. It's very reminiscent of Star Trek, in the sense that discovery and human connection and social politics are kind of at the forefront. Rather than her books being a giant intergalactic space opera full of warfare, it's more on the ground level. It's far more small and enclosed and intimate. It is about the connections between people and about the way that the people discover each other's races and cultures. And it's about understanding and reaching out and making connections with other people. There's something so fantastic about the way that she treats science fiction. And it really is reminiscent of Star Trek in that way. This particular book is incredibly small and intimate. It's about two people and it follows two different timelines. One of them is an AI who was the ship AI from her first novel, The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet, who has now become an android. She's been taken out of the ship and she's been put into a humanoid body. And it's about her learning to live this whole new life with a whole new group of people in a whole new place in a whole new body. And then the other narrative is about Pepper, who again was a character in the first book. And you get to learn about Pepper when she was a child and what she went through, where she was born, where she was raised and the things that she went through when she was between about 10 and 20 years old. And it's such an intimate narrative about people and their relationships to one another, the traumas that we create, the found families and connections that we make. I love this book. I love all of her books. Quick break from the books. I also read quite a lot of manga this month and one of the manga that I finished was Chainsaw Man. I love Chainsaw Man. It is one of my favorite manga. I have a Chainsaw Man tattoo on my leg, which I've mentioned before. Chainsaw Man by Tatsuki Fujimoto is a revelation when it comes to shonen manga because it is a love letter to so much great horror, especially horror cinema, but it is also a frantic and fun and ethically experimental kind of a manga. It fuses camp and silliness and goofy humor with very, very existential questions and answers. There's so much to love about Chainsaw Man in terms of its art direction, its concepts, its bombastic action, and also mostly for me, the connection between its characters. Human connection, as you can tell, is something that is very important to me. I value it so much when it comes to things like friendships and found families and romances. And Chainsaw Man does that so much better than you think it will, especially when you first start reading it or when you first hear about it. The concept of a strange man who can turn into a chainsaw. <laughs> 
it's so much bigger and better and smarter than you expect it to be. I've now finished all of what's currently available, all, I think, 97 chapters. I love Chainsaw Man so dearly. Nettle Black. This was a very, very important book for me this month, mostly because I did the coolest thing that I've done in my career so far, which was be invited to host and interview a panel of authors in a big event space at Foyle's Bookshop on Charing Cross Road in London. I did this last week, and one of the authors that I got to interview on that panel was Nat Reeve, author of Nettle Black, and this is their debut novel. Doing that panel, doing that interview was an incredible experience, and I really, really hope I get to do way more of it in the future, because in my opinion, I'm proper good at it. <laughs> I got to interview Juliet Jacks, River Solomon, Alison Rumfit, and Nat Reeve. And Nat Reeve was the most charming and thoughtful interviewee. As for what Nettle Black is about, it is something that takes great inspiration from Shakespeare, Dickens, I guess Wilkie Collins, Agatha Christie, Terry Pratchett, a lot of different people. And it also is something that is incredibly fresh and exciting. It is a piece of historical fiction, it's an epistolary novel, it's set in the late Victorian period, it feels a lot like the movie Hot Fuzz at times, and it is incredibly, wonderfully genderqueer. I did a review of it, in which I was incredibly sweaty, even sweatier than I am right now, because we're going through a heat wave that just doesn't end. Thank you, climate change. So you can watch that video if you want to learn more of my thoughts on this book, but I didn't go into the Shakespeare influence enough. That was something that I kind of regret about that video, is that this is an incredibly Shakespearean book. If you look back at Shakespeare's comedies, at the ridiculousness of the comedic tropes and ideas, and the jokes that Shakespeare makes in his comedies, a lot of that is here. A lot of camp and pomp and silliness, quirky, charming, endearing stuff, it's all here, even down to the names. One of my favourite character names in Shakespeare is Dogberry, from Much Ado About Nothing. And character names like Dogberry also come up here, with the town that this book is set in being called Dallyangle. And the first non-binary character that you meet in here is this strange, enigmatic, pompous, dandy character called Pip Property, which feels like a very Dickensian name. This is also an epistolary novel that is all written in notes and diary entries and letters that adds a layer of intimacy to it and puts you closer to the character's thoughts and feelings in the moment, which I always appreciate. I am an absolute sucker for epistolary stories. Nettle Black is laugh out loud funny. It is touching, it is warming, it is kind, it is sweet, and it's incredibly queer and incredibly thoughtful. It's such a kind novel. I love Nettle Black to bits. I Want to Die, But I Want to Eat Tokboki by Beg Sehi. This is, oh my god, I love this book. My review did pretty well, so a few of you have probably seen it. I Want to Die, But I Want to Eat Tokboki is not a novel. It is a piece of non-fiction. It is a transcript of a young, depressed woman visiting her psychiatrist and just writing down their sessions, with the psychiatrist's permission. It's a Korean book translated by Anton He, who did an absolutely splendid job, because he always does. And it's a book that's so relatable. If you've ever struggled with depression, or you have a friend or family member with depression, you're going to get a lot out of this in terms of empathy. If you are someone who's very unfamiliar with depression, you really can't relate to it. Or maybe you thought you couldn't. You'll still feel empathetic towards this situation. Maybe because you realize, oh actually, yeah, I do relate to some of this and I didn't realize, and maybe I could do with therapy too. Or you really are okay, and you read this and now you understand better what other people go through, things that you just couldn't have imagined until now. No matter who you are and what your mental state is, you're going to get something out of this. Whether it feels like companionship and camaraderie, or someone to just teach you and educate you better on the different ways that people experience life. I'm feeling much, much better. I've been going through some deep, dark depression lately, and I feel like I've really come out of it. I'm feeling so much better, and I'm very glad for that, and it's mostly because I went on medication, and antidepressants have saved my life. But when I was feeling depressed, I remember calling my mum, and she said to me, well, it's a lovely, beautiful day, why don't you go for a walk, the sun is shining, etc. And I was trying to explain that none of that matters when you're depressed. Sunshine doesn't mean anything. A beautiful, sunny day does nothing for you. And you know you should appreciate it, you can see that it's a beautiful day, but you don't care. You feel kind of nihilistic towards it. What does it matter to me? How does this impact me? I still feel like dirt. And in that way, in that moment, my mother, who doesn't have depression, couldn't relate to me. But she understood me, because she's kind. 
and sympathetic. And this book can do the same for other people. People who are kind and sympathetic and want to know more about depression. It's, it's wonderfully accessible and interesting and introspective. I am so grateful for this book. A book that I read last week and haven't mentioned at all is The Dance Tree by Kira Millwood Hargrave, a British author that I am a huge fan of. Her book The Mercies was a really big hit. It turned a lot of heads. It had a lot of us paying attention. A fantastic feminist piece of historical fiction. I love that book. I'd love to see it turned into a film. I think it could be a wonderful film. And this is her next book after that, except for a children's book she wrote recently called Julia and the Shark, which I haven't read because I don't read a lot of children's books. But The Dance Tree is really, really excellent. However, it does tread a lot of familiar ground. It feels in some ways like an amalgamation of a lot of the themes and tropes and characters and settings that we've seen a lot in historical fiction recently. It reminded me so much of the works of Stacey Halls, mixed with the Manning Tree Witches, mixed with a few other things. And it felt like, yeah, okay, we're seeing these character types and these types of events and these themes, we're seeing them all crop up again and again in British historical fiction at the moment, because historical fiction is so popular right now. And I love it. I'm reading so much British historical fiction all the time. I've been reading it for years now. I can't get enough of it. And that's why I read this. That's why I like Kira Millwood Hargrave. But it's not as original as The Mercies. The Mercies really felt like something unique, as did her YA novel The Deathless Girls. I loved that book. It was a really unique take on the Dracula mythology. This is a great book, but it's just as great as all the other great pieces of historical fiction that I like. It's set in Strasbourg in the 16th century. It's about a woman who is trying to get pregnant and she just keeps failing. She has miscarried 12 times. And the dance tree is a tree where she has buried little headstones and tied little ribbons to the tree dedicated to all the children that she's lost. It's very, very sad, but it's also a pagan thing. And we're living in a very witch hunty Christian time and doing something pagan is kind of risky. But her husband had a sister who was banished she was sent off to a nunnery for like seven years, and now she's finally back. And we don't know what her sin was, what she did wrong, and we learn about it sort of at the halfway point, and it's kind of the twist of the book. It's something that you could guess, because you can kind of think of what sins people might be punished for, especially at that time. What might she have done? You can kind of guess it. So it's about her relationship with our protagonist and how they slowly become friends and a few other people as well. It's very much a story of sisterhood and the things that women go through, shared traumas, shared oppression by patriarchy, etc. And in that way, it really reminded me of The Manning Tree Witches, which is also a wonderful book, one of my favorites. So this isn't doing a lot of things that are that new, but it's still a wonderfully good book to read. It is a solid read because Kirill Millward Hargrave is a wonderful author. And if you like a lot of British historical fiction, you're gonna love this. Another manga that I read that I really, really enjoyed was I Married My Best Friend to Shut My Parents Up, which is a Yuri or lesbian manga, which I absolutely loved. And again, I did a dedicated video on it, which is probably my worst performing video in months. God knows why. I feel like if I mention lesbians, the YouTube algorithm buries it. That's what I've experienced at least. But this is a wonderful lesbian manga. It is something that I was wary about going in because just the title alone kind of set my teeth on edge. I was like, what is this gonna be about? Is this gonna be cringe? Is this gonna be kind of lightly homophobic? No, no, not at all. It is about a person's self-discovery of something that they should have known all along, and it took an experience and a situation to bring that out of them, and I thought that that was so relatable to me. I've talked a lot in videos over the last year or two about the fact that it took me so long in my life to understand my gender and sexual identities, and this book felt like something that I could relate to so intensely. It's a manga about a young woman who is living with her best friend who is gay and has a crush on her, and the two of them agree to get married so that her parents will be too angry to set her up with any more men or hound her about marrying a guy and having kids and settling down and all that stuff. But the fact that she was willing to marry her best friend, the fact that she was willing to upset the status quo, upset her parents, piss everybody off, means that there was something in her that wanted this all along, and she is discovering her queerness a little bit later in life through the actions that she is willing to put herself through because she wants them. And it's wonderfully handled, and it's also very short. It's a single volume manga that I really, really recommend. 
I've also done a dedicated video on this, one of the best pieces of science fiction I've read in years, How High We Go in the Dark by Sakoya Nagamatsu. This is a novel, but it's also a kind of short story collection. Every chapter in here is a self-contained short story set in the same world that put together create a chronological narrative. So the book is a novel, it is traveling through time from one point to another, but every chapter takes us forward you know, a few years from different perspectives. So we're jumping around the world and jumping forward a little bit every time. Very creative way of building a narrative. And so if you're someone like me who absolutely adores short story collections and loves science fiction and loves eco novels, this is all of that while still being a novel. Very clever stuff. Trigger warnings for anyone who gets nervous about climate change or gets funny about health stuff, maybe has health anxiety, because I am both of those things. I have health anxiety and I'm terrified of climate change. And this book at times was a bit of a struggle, but it's worth it. If you can stomach those things, which I chose to, it is a very rewarding book about pandemics, about climate change, about the world coming to an end. But running theme with all the books I've been reading this month, it's about human connection. It's about what people can do when they come together. Human discovery and invention, because it's sci-fi, but also about us connecting and holding on to one another. It is literally about how high we go in the dark. Very cleverly stitched together narratives, beautiful stories about human connection. I cannot recommend this enough. And the last book I read this month, which I will be doing a dedicated video on, is Briefly A Delicious Life by Nell Stevens. This is a sexy, sensual, beautiful novel. Nell Stevens wrote a, I think it's a memoir or a pseudo-biography thing called Mrs. Gaskell and Me, which I believe is about the author Elizabeth Gaskell who wrote North and South, one of my favorite pieces of Victorian literature. So I really need to check that book out because I love North and South. If you haven't read North and South, it's basically Pride and Prejudice, but better. At least for me. It's Pride and Prejudice, but with socialist politics about unions and industry. It's so good. I love North and South. The TV adaptation is also fantastic if you want to watch that as well. It's a BBC miniseries, I think. Getting off track. Briefly, A Delicious Life is set in the early 1800s, I think, 1830 something. And it's about two real historical figures. <laughs> and it's about two real historical figures, one of them being Chopin, the composer. And the other is George Sand. Now, George Sand is someone that I didn't know anything about. Big gap in my knowledge. George Sand was a French novelist who used to dress as a man to get into men's spaces and go around the city where women couldn't go. And apparently at that time, you actually needed like a document to be given to you by the government to say as a woman, you were allowed to dress in masculine clothing, but she just didn't. And so she was, as far as I can tell, a pretty interesting feminist person. And she and Chopin had a love affair. She has two kids. And in this novel, the four of them all go to Mallorca and they stay at this charter house in Mallorca because Chopin has consumption and is dying of it. And so they go there to get fresh air, get away from Paris and just chill and relax and eat pomegranates and have sex. But the whole book is told from the perspective of a ghost who has been haunting the charter house for 500 years. She died as a teenager, and now she haunts the charter house. And she immediately falls in love with George Sand the moment she lays eyes on her. She's like, yep, yep, wow, that beautiful, masculine, gorgeous woman, I need her, I love her, and she becomes obsessed. This ghost, after she died, realized she really liked women and has just fallen in love over and over again with the women that have passed through this charter house over 500 years, and she is obsessed with George Sand. And from her perspective, we watch George and Chopin and her kids together on the island, being treated like shit by the locals, being avoided because Chopin is diseased. And it's a really sexy, sensual book about romance, about sex, about friendships, about lust. It's gorgeous. The language, the cover design, everything about it has sensuality wrapped up in it. And I can't wait to talk about it more in a proper video. I actually thought I'd read more books than this this month, but I read quite a lot of manga that I haven't talked about. You can find a lot of manga related articles on our site if you want to check them out. I think that's everything. Maybe I'm missing something. I don't know. Anyway, subscribe for books and join my Patreon if you want to support me because I really, 
Really appreciate it. Bye.